Welcome to Book, Chapter, and Verse. Hi, I'm Dennis Tucker, and I'll be your speaker for the next 30 minutes. I'm glad that you decided to tune in at this time. This program is being brought to you by the West Side Church of Christ, and our desire is to take about 30 minutes to study about this, the Bible, and to reason together. If you've been watching some of the earlier programs we've had, you know we've been talking about what is needed in religion. And we pointed out what's needed in religion are things such as transparency, an understanding of what God wants us to do, understanding of the Bible, and that God is a transparent God. He has not tried to hide anything from us, but he has revealed himself to us. Also, intellectual honesty. We need to be honest with studying together from the Word of God and seeking to find out the truth instead of trying to justify ourselves. We talked about true compassion last week as we noted that we need to have a compassion that is based again upon the Bible of understanding what is needed and providing that to each other. And so we want to continue our studies this morning or this time. Let me encourage you to perhaps to sit down with your Bible as we have this time together. Open to the passages we're talking about. If you have a piece of paper, a pad of paper, uh, feel free to write down any comments, questions you may have. And at the end of the program, I'll tell you how to uh, contact me with your questions. We'll spend some time on this program, if necessary, to actually talk about questions people have about the Bible. But our desire really is simply to study together for the next 30 minutes. And as we do that, at this time, we want to talk about what is needed in religion. Another thing uh, that's talked about as far as godly zeal. Uh, godly zeal is needed in religion. It's obvious that to a lot of people, religion is maybe a necessary evil, if I can use that phrase, evil and religion together. Uh, but it's something that they're really they're not interested in. It's something perhaps like going to the dentist or going uh, to the doctor. You have to do it every now and then, but it's not something that people really relish, it seems like. Uh, people are often find excuses to not go to worship services, not spend time actually doing what the Bible says. And it's common, uh, looking around at denominations. If you look at newspapers or read bulletins, look at flyers that are sent out, it's obvious that a number of places have resorted to gimmicks so as to try to get people to come to their services. Whether we're talking about pony rides for those that come to Vacation Bible School, uh, whether we're talking about meals so as to uh, get people inside the building or provide you free meals, free recreation, free entertainment, or maybe something else they're trying to do so as to get people in, uh, but they're simply gimmicks, uh, trying to maybe entice those that really would not otherwise be interested in a Bible study or worship to God uh, to come in and to do that. And we're not going to do that. We're not going to resort to gimmicks at the West Side Church of Christ. But what we do want is we want to understand godly zeal uh, the place for the proper place for it, even talk a little bit about how do we attain that godly zeal. As you look in the Bible, let's keep in mind that zeal and godliness goes together. Uh, that in fact, it's impossible really to please God unless we have a zealous desire to serve Him. Uh, the phrase zeal, or the word zeal itself, uh, means basically an undivided service. It means to seek to please one source or to have one goal in mind. It's the same idea of a fervent spirit as talked about in the Bible. And a word that's closely connected to zeal in the Bible is also the word jealous. And that in some passages, they're really the same word. It's just depending on the usage of which way it's translated. But as we look in Exodus 20 and verse 5, that's the word God used to describe himself when he said, I am a jealous God. And in that passage, Exodus 20 chapters, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And the first commandment is that thou shalt have no other gods beside me. And the second is thou shalt have no graven images. And therefore, he's pointing out to them that he is a jealous God, not willing to share his people with other gods or with other uh, so-called gods in life. As you look over a little bit later in the book of Exodus, in Exodus 34 chapter, we find around verse 12 through verse 17. Let me read this to you. But there in verse 12 it says, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. 
But he shall destroy their altars, break the sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For he shall worship no other god. For the Lord his name is jealous. He is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with inheritance of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifice to their gods, and one that invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughter for your sons, and his daughter play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molten in the gods for yourself. And God wasn't concerned that he would be replaced by the gods. It wasn't a case where uh, God is saying, now, if you have other gods, maybe I'll become second, third, or fourth in your list of deities. But he's pointing out that even if he was number one, that there can only be one God on the list of gods, that we have to serve him and him only. And so he is a jealous God. Uh, he wants our undivided attention, undivided service. As go in the New Testament, there is passage that describes the character of Christians in Titus, the second chapter, verse 14. In Titus 2, he points out that we are his own special people. And then in Titus, the second chapter, let me find my passage here, it goes on in verse 14, it says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people. The last part of this verse, though, says, Zealous for good works. That we have been sanctified, we've been set apart for a purpose. And the purpose is not just not to do evil, but the purpose is to do good works. And not just do good works, but to be zealous in our desire to do good. So godliness and zeal go together. Now, we have to keep in mind, though, that as we look in the Bible, that there are some types of zeal that is not good. A zeal just for the sake of zeal really doesn't do a whole lot of good. In fact, it may mislead us, and it may create problems among people. You look in, in Romans 12, 10 chapter, Romans 10 chapter, the Apostle Paul there, and talking about his brethren, his Jewish brethren, uh, pointing out that there was zeal there, but there was a zeal without knowledge. In Romans 10, chapter, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear the witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they be ignorant of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Notice in the passage that there was a zeal there. He did not question their fervent desire to please God. And he acknowledged it was there. However, instead of submitting to the righteousness of God, instead of doing what God said to do, they were seeking to establish their own righteousness, their own zeal for their own laws. And so that's a problem that's creating. And, then, and we find that today, we find that in the Bible, that a lot of times people uh, may be united in actually doing something, but it may be the wrong thing. We look in the Bible, we had different occasions of that, different accounts of that. And in Genesis 11 chapter, after the flood that God told Noah and his family, and therefore all of mankind after them, to go out and multiply and replenish the earth. He wanted them to spread out and to take over the earth like they had before. However, in Genesis 11 chapter, we find that the people, instead of doing what God said to do, decided to build a tower so as to reach up into heavens. In Genesis 11 chapter verse 4, we can read about that account, and it points out that they were using uh, mortar and asphalt and bricks, and they, they were working this tower, and it's called the Tower of Babel, while well, I refer to it, of course, and they were doing it, they were zealous in doing that, but it was not according to the will of God. It was not what God said to do. And so sometimes we may be united. People may be enthused about something, united about it, and they think, boy, how good this is that we're all doing this together. But if it's not according to the word of God, then it's for a wrong purpose. We find another occasion that go on in the Old Testament, and that is the prophets of Baal and their religious service. And uh, 1 Kings 18 chapter, we read there, about Elijah the prophets when he challenged these prophets of Baal to offer a sacrifice to their God. And he would offer a sacrifice to his God, to Jehovah, and they would just see which God would come down to consume their sacrifice. 
Now, as he does that, I want you to notice, as you read here in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, the zeal of these prophets of Baal. In verse 25, he says, Choose one bull for yourselves, and prepare it first, for you are many, and call the name of your God, but put for no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about on the altar which they had made. As you go down verse 28, it said, They cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances till blood gushed out on them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied till the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Do you see here, though, that these people, it wasn't because of lack of zeal they failed. I, I mean, they were crying out. They were cutting themselves with knives and blood gushing out. It's talking about all the day. They just didn't, uh, did it once or twice and said, oh, well, we might as well just quit and just give up. I know they continued onward uh, and, and continued to hope that their God, uh, Baal, would come down to send their sacrifice. I submit to you that these people were zealous for their God. But again, it wasn't the right God that they were trying to worship. And so their zeal was misdirected. And then also we go on in the New Testament, we find that there was zeal of the Jews and persecuting Christians. That when Paul, and we read through the book of Acts, as Peter goes out and starts preaching the gospel, as Paul goes out preaching the gospel, that we find in a lot of the times, their travels, they would be persecuted by Jews who were trying to stop the preaching of the gospel of Christ. And when they would leave one city, that the Jews then would just stop then and say, okay, we got rid of him, we got rid of that person, and let's just go back about our daily activities. Instead, they would pursue Paul. They would go ahead to the next city where he's preaching at, and they would make problems there. I submit to you again that they were zealous for their law. They were zealous for protecting the law of Moses. And so and this required effort, required time, required them traveling. I mean, you have to, again, you have to admire that these people did have zeal. I don't think there's any question about it. And that's the point Paul's making there in Romans 10, chapter, verses 1 through 3, that they had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And I can give you one other example of a, a zeal that was there, but without knowledge. And that is the zeal of, the, of Paul, at that time it was called Saul of Tarsus, before he obeyed the gospel. As Saul recounts his life as a Jew before obeying the gospel of Christ, in Acts, the 22nd chapter, verses 3 through 5, he recounts his zeal for, again, protecting the law of Moses and persecuting Christians. In verse 3, he says, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicily, but brought up in a city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. He wasn't, again, doubting their zeal either. But he said, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and devouring and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders for whom I received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were uh, there to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul didn't just quit when the Christians left where he was. He went ahead and pursued them to other places. But no, sir, he said he was zealous in his persecution of Christians. However, later on, Paul would say that he did it in ignorance. He did it without understanding. And so we look and we see that there are religious groups today that I think we could classify as being a zealous in their service, but again, it's not according to knowledge. Many of the cults, perhaps you've heard of the Moonies, uh, Reverend Sung Young Moon and the Moonies group that follow him as they will do all kinds of things and make sacrifices. I don't question their zeal. In fact, I think probably they are very zealous in their service to misguided as may be in service to God. I think we look around at some uh, other religious groups uh, that are even Christian in origin uh, as far as trying to serve Christ. And uh, they may show a lot of zeal. They have a lot of hand clapping, a lot of shouting, a lot of uh, emotionalism, anything by pleasing them, by pleasing and arousing their emotions, then they automatically are pleasing God. However, that's not always true. And so zeal without knowledge is not needed in religion. What is needed in religion today is zeal with knowledge, is a godly zeal. 
But we also say that there are other kinds of zeal that's not needed. And that is a lacking zeal is not needed. A having knowledge without zeal is also not needed. We read in Revelation 3rd chapter, it's writing to the church here of Laodicea. And as it describes this congregation, they're known basically as the lukewarm church. As you look in Revelation the third chapter and verse 14, it says to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. The problem here wasn't one of doctrinal error. It wasn't they had perverted the gospel of Christ. There were other congregations we read about here in Revelation that had allowed false teachers to come in. Uh, Nicolaitan, Dr. Nicolaitan talked about one to one church. Or they allowed individuals with great influence like Jezebel come in and to, to teach things, to do things not proper sight of God. Leon said didn't have that problem. Well, see, apparently, doctrinally, they were sound. However, they were lukewarm. That phrase itself tells us something. And God is saying, I wish you were cold or hot. Now, when something is lukewarm, basically what we mean by that is just room temperature. Whatever temperature in a room is, that's what that may be. That whatever it is, whether it's a cup of coffee or a cup of or maybe some, a soft drink or, whatever, or some food, whatever it is, and most things we eat, we really like to be either hot or cold. Coffee, for instance. Uh, I drink my coffee hot. Now, my wife likes iced coffee. And she'll make some kind of concoction where she has some milk in it and, and also some uh, uh, sweetened oil in it or some kind of sweetener in it. And she pours coffee in there and also has some ice in there. And, and that's good. She thinks that's good. Well, that's all right. I mean, that's the way some people like it. They like iced coffee. Uh, most people, or people like myself, we like it hot. And However, if you put a cup of hot coffee down on the table and leave it there for a long enough time, after a while it assumes room temperature. And then when you pick that up, for some reason it's just not as good. In fact, sometimes just plain taste is terrible. You, know, you want to spit it out. And so as well as cases by either being hot or cold, you can drink and tolerate it one way or the other, but when it's a room temperature, it really becomes repulsive. And that's why God is saying to us that he wished these people would either choose to serve him or serve the, or turn to, uh, away from him, but at least make a choice, at least be one or the other. And it's, it's important for us to understand this because sometimes we may say, I have knowledge, I know the right thing to do. Well, that's good, that, that's necessary. However, the real question is, are we doing the right thing? And James 4, chapter, verse 17, it says, Therefore the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. Now we can sometimes mislead ourselves in thinking, okay, I know how to worship God. I know how, what type of songs we need to sing to please God. I know uh, what day we come together to worship God. I know what the Lord's Supper is all about. And I know what the Bible says about salvation, and we may go on and on about our knowledge of the Bible. We may have a lot of knowledge. However, the question is, are we doing what the Bible says? And we're not, then we have knowledge without zeal. We don't need knowledge without zeal. Another kind of zeal that's wrong is a misguided zeal. A zeal for traditions. Uh, we find in the Bible that traditions are mentioned sometimes in a positive way and sometimes in a negative way. But the traditions of men are negative. And the Apostle Paul talked about when he was converted, before he became a Christian, that he was fulfilling or keeping the traditions of his fathers. In Galatians, the first chapter, verse 14, he says, And I advance my Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Uh, Paul, Paul was going to make sure that nobody changed his traditions. He was doing what his parents had done and what their parents had done. He was keeping those traditions. Well, instead of being concerned about the, the traditions of his father, he should have been concerned about the law of God, what God was saying to do. 
And finally, another kind of zeal we don't need is a misguided zeal for even some things that are, can be good. Over in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 14 chapter, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 14 chapter, and verse 12, a problem here at Corinth was the spiritual gifts. They had people that could prophesy, that could uh, maybe interpret tongues or speak in tongues, somebody else could interpret tongues. Uh, somebody may be able to heal. So they have these spiritual gifts. But in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12, uh, the apostle says, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. The problem you see was they wanted to use these gifts to glorify themselves. Uh, they liked the attention of people listening to them, of a tongue speaker, perhaps everybody paying attention to them, uh, somebody that prophesy of, again, people could listen to them. And so instead of using these gifts to glorify and edify the church, they were wanting to use it for themselves. And so this was a, a zeal centered on, on me. Uh, what am I going to get out of this type of, of zeal? Uh, that's not the kind of zeal we need either. Instead, what we need is a godly zeal. Now, let me submit to you some people in the Bible that would be good for us to emulate in our lives. Uh, one man is by the name of Phineas. Now, Phineas was a son of Aaron. He's one of the priesthood. In Numbers 25th chapter, we have, actually just a little bit earlier than this, we have Balaam uh, that told Balak, one way to defeat the nation of Israel was to have your daughters to marry their sons. Introduce your gods to them, and they will follow after your gods. Well, sure enough, that's what's happening here in Numbers 25th chapter. We have a man that goes out, and he takes a woman, uh, the people of the land, a people that the children of Israel were told to stay away from, and takes her into his tent in front of the whole congregation. In Numbers uh, 25th chapter, verse 6, it says that. Well, Phineas was not one to stand by and just say, well, that's terrible. <laughs> that really shouldn't happen. And he wasn't one to just say, let's go home. Instead, in verse 7, it said, Now when Phineas saw the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest saw it. He rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman threw her body. Now, I submit to you, there was a zeal here. Somebody may say, yeah, but that was a bad zeal. No, it was really bad zeal. I submit to you that this was a zeal based upon God's law. That he understood that this man was flaunting his sin in front of everybody. This man knew he had done wrong. Did not care. Maybe he was kind of boastful about it. And so Phineas stopped this man from his sin by killing him here. And as you go on in this verse here, to uh, verse 8, where I have stopped at, it said that he thrust them through with both of them through the body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. He said the last part of that is important because there was a plague. God was killing his people because of the sins they were committing. But when Phineas took this action, God stopped the plague. I submit to you, this shows that the, the zeal of Phineas here was pleasing to God. We need to have a zeal in standing against those who are sinning, against, standing against sin. And we need to have a zeal that says we will not endorse sin or look the other way, but we will speak out against sin. Now, I'm not saying we need to try to hurt our neighbor. We need to try to kill anybody. Don't misunderstand me. But we need to have kind of a zeal Phineas here had as far as understanding what sin was and standing up against sin. We have David, King David. And David did some things that were good and some things that were bad in his life. But one of the passages that stands out in my mind about King David is in 2 Samuel 24, chapter. Uh, there he goes to a man's threshing floor, and he's going to offer a sacrifice to God. Uh, this man says, let me provide. I have the, that which is necessary for the sacrifice. In, number, in 2 Samuel 24, chapter, verse 22 to 25. And as he does, as he makes his offer, David, though, turns around and says, I will not offer a sacrifice to God that costs me nothing. We have to keep in mind what the word sacrifice means. It means that we're paying a penalty. We're paying something to do this. And we need to have a zeal in our sacrifice to God. There may be times that we do have to give up things in order to serve him. And in our society today, very seldom, I think, we really have to say, I give up a lot to serve God. 
But we need to have a zeal being willing to go the extra mile. To do that, which may cost us our time, which may cost us some of our sleep, or may cost some of our energy, or some of our money. We need to have a zeal and a sacrifice unto God. And then also we have the zeal of the Apostle Paul. As talked about it, when he mentioned that earlier he had persecuted Christians. But then when he obeyed the gospel of Christ, that he was zealous in doing what Christ said to do. In Acts 9, chapter, verse 26 and 27. And this speaks about him after his conversion. When it comes to Jerusalem, and it points out in verse 26 that they were afraid when he came to Jerusalem. Uh, the, the saints there, the Christians there, were afraid of this man. Because after all, he had been persecuting them. They knew that he had a zeal against them. However, in verse 27, he tells us that he had been in Damascus and his peace about how he had spoken or preached boldly at Damascus. I submit to you that when you study the life of Paul, you see the same zeal, the same undivided service to God after he became a Christian as he had before he became a Christian. We need to have the same zeal and serving God, or maybe more zeal in serving God than what we used to before we served Him, before we learned the truth. I know a lot of people that may have been very zealous in false religions, and when they learn the truth, they, they continue to have the same zeal. They, that's what we need to also, in order to serve God faithfully. And then also we can talk about Jesus, obviously, that Jesus has zeal. In John 2nd chapter, verses 13 through 17, as when... Jesus cast out the money changers from the temple and he pointed out that, that uh, then the disciples remembered that uh, a prophecy of the Old Testament that zeal for thy house has consumed me. Jesus was serving God without division. He was serving him with fervent desire. Now how do we get this zeal? Well, I think first of all we have to understand that zeal is going to come through our study of the word of God. That it's not going to come just by saying I'm going to be zealous or I'm just going to uh, just try to have this fervent desire. We have to have the right basis. And that bright basis is a study and knowledge of God's law. As we understand it, as we understand the importance of it, that should increase our zeal. In Luke, the 24th chapter, read there about two men on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus explained to them the prophecy of the Old Testament uh, because they, were, they had remembered about Jesus just dying a few days before in the, the Jerusalem. And as he tells them about the prophecy of the Old Testament, that this year was fulfilling the prophecies, he then leaves, but they said, did not our heart burn within us? That's what we need when we hear the word of God. We need to take it to our hearts. And second thing is we need to be around people that also have a zeal to serve God. We need to have uh, people that are zealous for good works. And those are two ways we can increase our zeal and serve to God. And so we need to ask a question such as, am I trying to serve God? Do I complain when you know, it's hard to go to services? Do I complain about that? Uh, do I think about trying to go the extra mile or am I looking for excuses not to do what the Bible says? When I get ready to go to services, have I studied my Bible lessons? Have I, do I have my Bible? Have I thought about God during the week? Those kind of questions we need to be asking ourselves as far as are we really trying to serve God or are we just giving God the leftovers? If we don't have zeal, we're not going to make it to heaven. That's what's going to be necessary for us to get there. I do appreciate you listening to this program. Again, let me tell you, this is being brought to you by the West Side Church of Christ. Our building is located at 4201 Bent Tree Drive. That's here in Owensboro. It's behind the post office on Highway 60 if you're trying to find it. And let me invite you to our services. Sunday morning, 930, we have Bible classes for all ages. You have young children, we have classes for them. You're an adult, we also have classes for you. And then at 1030, we have a time of worship. We'll last about an hour. We will sing songs, praise to God. We will study together. We'll have prayers. We'll observe the Lord's death as we take of the Lord's Supper. And as Christians, we are commanded to give on the first day of the week. But as visitors, you won't be asked to give a dime. We simply want you there to study and to worship with us. And then Sunday night at 6.30 again, we come together to worship God. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we have Bible classes for all ages again. And so I hope you come be with us. Now, if you want to receive a copy of this program, or want to correspond with me, then you can do so by, first of all, by writing me. Uh, we have email, wcoc at bellsouth.net. Or you can write to me, again, 4201 Bent Tree Drive, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42301. Send it that away. Or also we have a, a website, 
thewestsidechurch.us. And you can contact us that way. Also on that website, we have all kinds of aids in your Bible studies. And we have a list of the form, or previous television programs we've had here on Book, Chapter, and Verse. And so I look forward to hearing from you. Hope you have a good week. But again, tune in next week for this program. Thank you.